Welcome to the panel. Uh, we've got, uh, we've obviously got Andrew down at the end. We've got Seed Signer in the middle here. We've got Justine. Um, I'll just get a quick intro from each of you, if that's cool. Andrew, maybe you can start. Yeah, uh, my name is Andrew Yang. I'm a client advisor at Casa, and we offer one of the most secure ways or uh, wallets you can use to secure your Bitcoin. Awesome. Seed Signer. I'm Seed Signer, and I created and lead an open source project that allows people to build the functional equivalent of a Bitcoin hardware wallet using kind of off the shelf generic uh, electronic parts for about $50, maybe a little more, a little less, uh, depending on what part of the world you live in. But we have a focus on multi sig uh, Bitcoin custody as well as Bitcoin as the use of a more long-term kind of savings te technology. And just before I get to Justine, there are a bunch of seed signers over here that people can, I believe, partake in and, and play with and, and take home? Correct. It's, it's up to Alex how, the, how those get distributed, but when Alex... Okay, so it's after... Be a fight. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. when Alex asks if you can build 50 seed signers for yeah. uh, an event like this, like, you, it's... Yes or no is not an option, it's yeah. yes. <laughs> so after the panel, uh, it's a fight to the death over here, okay? Um, and then we'll finish with uh, Justine. Hi, my name is Justine Harper. I am a hardcore Bitcoiner and believer in education being empowerment. I'm also the VP of Concierge at Unchained Capital. We help empower people by uh, offering financial services built on Bitcoin self-custody. Awesome. So we're going to talk about custody and, and how it differs from what you may be used to with traditional finance. Because when you get to the very basics and, and people are just diving into Bitcoin, it's, it's a no-brainer that, that nobody would understand even what a wallet entails because it's so starkly different from even just the term that it was given. A wallet does not, in the terms of Bitcoin, uh, a wallet does not actually hold your money because Bitcoin is just a global ledger saying who owns what. Uh, what a wallet holds is keys to your money. And those keys, they have the same qualities as a regular key. Uh, it unlocks uh, whatever's behind that key. So in this case, your Bitcoin. Uh, but it can also be copied. So you can make a copy of your house key. If uh, somebody else has a copy of that house key, they can unlock what it unlocks. They can get anything in your house. If somebody has a copy of your Bitcoin key, they can unlock your funds. So it's important to know kind of what you're dealing with when you're dealing with a Bitcoin wallet or a Bitcoin set of keys. It unlocks your money and you need to treat it as such. Um, the difference, and I'm just gonna kind of lay down a baseline here so everybody understands, the difference between an exchange and a wallet is that the exchange holds the keys to your money. You are inherently trusting them to hold your funds. It is an IOU that you can then withdraw later in most cases, but in some cases that's not even an option depending on the venue you're going through. You can get a Bitcoin wallet on your phone for free. Um, that is known as a hot wallet because it is connected to the internet. There are some risks involved in that. Obviously anything internet connected could potentially be compromised. And if the keys to your money reside on a device connected to the internet, and somebody gets into that device, they could then potentially remove your money. So just as you wouldn't walk around with $10,000 sitting in your pocket, hopefully, if you are, let me know. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully, uh, you wouldn't walk around with $10,000 of Bitcoin sitting on your internet connected phone, also hopefully. Uh, but some people would like greater security assurances than that. And that's where we get into the realm of, of hardware. And so, uh, Seed Signer, I was maybe going to toss it over to you. I was hoping that you might be able to enlighten the audience a little bit as to the differences between a hot wallet and a cold wallet. What does, it, what does a, a, a hardware wallet achieve that's not achievable with a hot wallet? Great. So um, with a lot of uh, information security issues, it's a trade-off between security and convenience. So if you have your private key stored on your phone, that's obviously a very convenient way to access your coins. Uh, but the trade-off is if anyone knows or is able to figure out uh, the pin code or the passphrase or whatever that is protecting your funds, and they can get a hold of your, your phone, they're gonna be able to take your money. So a hardware wallet is one of, you know, a, a different array of security measures that are put in place that also with that trade-off between convenience and security, they, they 
make it a little bit more inconvenient for you to access uh, your money. Mm -hmm. Our particular model is that the seed signer is an inherently offline device, um, so it's air-gapped, and it is a device that is not constructed to connect to the internet. It doesn't have the ability to communicate over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Its, its sole purpose is to keep your private keys private, and only when requested of the device uh, will it, it proves that it has knowledge of the keys. Mm -hmm. But the overall process, like with that trade-off, is a little more cumbersome, so it's a device that, uh, the device itself actually doesn't remember your private keys. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, as I said, designed to be stateless, so when it's powered off and power's removed from it, um, that device can actually be handed off to someone else and there's, there, there should be no evidence of your keys on it. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a little bit different model, but I think what is really helpful for people to consider is that spectrum of uh, security convenience and, and how, how you're trading your convenience for additional security. Yeah, so it's, so it's effectively a question of, of, of how accessible are the keys. A hot wallet, again, inherently in, uh, connected to the internet um, is, is just less secure than having your seed phrase either used with a device that has no ability to connect to the internet or a device that still houses the, the backup, but again, doesn't directly connect to the internet. Now, we're talking human rights and we're, we're talking uh, instances where you need to think very adversarially if you're in a, a situation um, where, where there are potentially governments that might just kick in your door and, and say, and Bitcoiners refer to this uh, at West as, as the $5 wrench attack, um, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, you can do all the encryption and security in the world, but if somebody kicks into your door and threatens you with a $5 wrench, uh, you're probably going to give, give up your keys, right? Um, but you can actually make yourself, uh, you can use tools to make yourself resistant to said $5 wrench attack um, through something called multisig or multisignature. And so, Justine, I was hoping you could maybe chat a little bit about what multisig is. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So as Ben described what a Bitcoin address is, what a multi-sig simply is, is an address that's constructed with more than one key. What this does is allow you to no longer have a single point of failure. Um, an individual could break into your home and you give them a key, they could walk away with it and they still don't have access to your Bitcoin because rules associated with that address tell the address how many keys of your quorum are needed to access that. So as an example, two of three. Um, in this situation as well, it helps from human error. Uh, most Bitcoin is, is lost due to human error. You can use, lose excuse me, a lot of information out of your quorum before you've lost your Bitcoin in a multi-sig setup. It also allows you to introduce a trusted third party, which we call collaborative custody, which is what my company, um, one aspect that my company does at Unchained Capital. And this allows you to include a trusted third party in your setup without giving them access to your Bitcoin. So in this situation, Unchained Capital would hold one, you hold two, you access your Bitcoin with no permission whatsoever. Uh, you can access it outside of Unchained Capital, but if you lose a key or need assistance, they're there for you. So it's almost like getting the, uh, the benefit of Bitcoin, um, but also the benefit of sort of a financial system that you can call an individual and get help on. But multi-sig can be done without a third party. It can be done completely independently and privately. And it just um, allows for no single points of failure. Yeah. That and would be my quick description of it. Yeah. And, and in some instances as well, if somebody were to kick in your door, get a hold of a, a security device, a hardware wallet, um, depending on, on how you dealt with it, they could take a look at that device and not even know that it's part of a multi-signature scheme. They, they would look at it, you could even have a little decoy amount on there, and they could think, oh, well, they didn't have very much, but at least I got it. Meanwhile, they're, they're not, none the wiser to the fact that this is part of a two or three or, or whatever other setup you have, that there's actual funds locked by two other keys that they're not aware of. The so. device doesn't even know, right? Yeah. I mean, and you could set up a single signature, like Ben said, um, signature, single signature wallet with that same device, and yes, an individual could take that, run with it, open the PIN number, and see your, your $10 of Bitcoin in your single sig and have no idea about your multi-sig address. Andrew, let's, let's talk. Ben. Let's talk <laughs> adversarially. Yes. Uh, how do you think this, this potentially, like from your view, you, you're, you're in the same realm as Justine, you guys deal with multi-signature. 
in your view, where is this beneficial? Yeah, um, so I've been having a lot of, uh, I've been trying to be very intentional about um, talking to other human rights activists here at this conference. And Alex, I just want to thank you so much. Like, this is so cool that you carved out a track for Bitcoiners and, for, and gave us a space to like talk to other people in this field. Mm -hmm. And it's just making it super easy. And um, one of the people that I chatted with yesterday actually was uh, Farida. And um, yeah, so I, we're, I was just like, you know, what are, are there any intersections between Bitcoin and activism? Like, how can we help, right? And uh, one of the things we talked about was how with the multi-sig, um, like Justine was saying, you know, you can create a single Bitcoin wallet with five keys or side, five uh, seed phrases. And um, the nature of this multi-sig can, can be like you can send Bitcoin out of it if you have a quorum of three, right? So of the five keys and you use any three of them to send Bitcoin out of this wallet. What you could do if you're, an, if you're an activist and you're fighting against the government and you're worried about being unbanked, right? Um, you can give these five keys to other five other people in your group, people that you trust, five other leaders. And what's powerful is that, let's say if one of them gets taken away um, and you lose access to that key, you still have your Bitcoin. And like they were saying, they won't know that you actually um, have Bitcoin, um, even if they get access to the hardware wallet or whatever. If they take two people, you still have a quorum of three and you can still send Bitcoin out of that multi-sig wallet. Um, and so, for me, it's beautiful because it, it allows um, you know, the fundamental property of Bitcoin's censorship resistance to be on full display within the form of a multi-sig wallet. Um, and there's other um, beneficial aspects of this, like um, accountability, right? Um, within the five members of this um, activist group, um, everyone gets to see how much uh, Bitcoin is in that wallet. And, and you need um, to coordinate together um, at least three people to send Bitcoin out. So you're not trusting one member of the organization anymore, which, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of trust. You're on the same mission, all that good stuff. But still, it's nice to have accountability uh, with your funds. And so you, you got to coordinate with two other people. Um, so you have three signatures to send Bitcoin out of it. And um, I think that just fundamentally just makes it easier uh, for people to protect their financial wealth and bring um, transparency uh, in, into that organization if, if mm -hmm. they don't have it already. Yeah, yeah. Um, you touched on user, user error and I think it's, it's important to have a, a discussion uh, around that when it comes to uh, holding your own funds because uh, Bitcoin is and can be a harsh mistress. Uh, many of us have learned in the past through mistakes, user error, um, even in a, a non-adversarial uh, environment is, is one of the quickest ways to, to lose your fund if, if you're not privy, if you're not being careful. So let's maybe talk about um, some of the hurdles, some of the mistakes that people can, can make so that, so that they can um, begin to recognize those and, and maybe prevent themselves from making those mistakes. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll hand it to Seed Signer. What would you say are some of the most common mistakes that people make um, in self-custody? I would argue that the most common mistake is, and I, I break it down into three threat categories when you're setting up Bitcoin. You're, uh, of course, trying to avoid the custodial rug pull, which is you know, some sort of third party that actually holds your coins, taking them. You're trying to uh, uh, outsmart or, or thwart an adversary, the, the $5 rent attack, or someone else who is personally trying to steal your Bitcoin because they know or think you have it. But the third category that a lot of people don't kind of consider in uh, securing their Bitcoin is securing your Bitcoin from yourself. You are trying to protect yourself from errors that you might make. And the number one uh, counter to the threat of yourself is practicing, being familiar, and being very comfortable with your setup. So our um, uh, device, uh, per se, uh, people may not realize there is a whole parallel Bitcoin network called Testnet. And I would encourage anybody who is setting up a multi-sig or even a single sig, all the devices that are commercially available or ones that you can build yourself are compatible with this test network that is um, comprised of coins that don't have a monetary value. It just exists for people to develop and test. Um, so the number one thing I encourage people when they're building a seed signer or even they're, if they're buying you know, a commercially available solution is get comfortable with your setup, understand the, uh, the computer that you're going to be using it on, the environment you're going to be using it in, and what you know, different features the device has, just dig in and get comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and there's and again we've we've been discussing about kind of this spectrum of of extreme ownership that you can have, and um, I would I would venture to say that the average person that is is technically savvy enough to operate a smartphone um, is is likely able to to have self sovereign ownership of their Bitcoin. Um, that said, you're absolutely right. Practice is imperative um, because if you've only done something once or twice and you've got your life savings sitting in it, even if you do do it correctly when you need to access those funds, you're gonna be sweating when you do it. Um, and so I I always highly recommend that people you know play with things, get a wallet, put ten bucks on it, if, and and just. Write your backup, delete the wallet. It gives you a little bit of skin in the game, and then it, it makes you, it forces you to see, okay, I've done this once, I was able to recover my funds with my backup. And so, again, this is something that we, even in this panel, we, we skipped over uh, mentioning, but whenever you create a Bitcoin wallet, your backup typically will be in the form of 12 to 24. English words that you can write down. And those 12 to 24 words are agnostic of the type of Bitcoin wallet you're using it in. So if you have a device that has a backup uh, of 12 words and you destroy said device, uh, you can then take those 12 words, use any other device or any other piece of software, any other Bitcoin wallet, and plug those 12 words in and it will recover your funds. Just as I said, copy of the house key, it unlocks the same thing. You just need a piece of software to access the network. So I think maybe I'll ask Justine here, um, what are some things that people should consider when they're, when they're trying to figure out how they want to custody their Bitcoin, whether it be um, you know, playing with a hot wallet, but more importantly, if they're looking at a, a device for savings or considering multi-sig down the line, what are considerations that need, people need to look at? It's a great question because uh, there's no one answer, right? Yeah. Um, everybody's mm -hmm. going to be using Bitcoin differently, um, and that's kind of the beauty of it. I would say the most important thing is to remember that it's okay to take steps. Um, I think Bitcoin can be really intimidating, and I find personally that many individuals don't move to self-custody because they feel like it's an all-or-nothing situation. Um, so my first step would be grab a mobile wallet, like you, like you mentioned, write down those words, understand what seed phrases are, do the recovery, get familiar with it before you go and put your whole life savings into a wallet. That would be my first suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, but also just to don't be afraid to try. But as far as actually looking at what you should do for custody, it depends on what you're wanting to do. Um, is this your it, like generational asset that you're going to be passing on to your children? Are you going to be you know, trading? If you're trading, your, your storage is gonna be a little bit differently. Um, for me, I think it's a generational asset. Um, so I'm looking at how to store something securely that I don't have a single point of failure. I'm not reliant on third parties, including devices, um, and how I can then pass it on to my, my children, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say device-wise, you want to look for something that, of course, always gives you those seed phrases, which is your master password, your most important thing in your setup. This is going to be, uh, enables you to always access your Bitcoin no matter what device you're using. The device is just a user interface that you would then input the, device, the seed phrases into. So yeah, what are they an open source? Can you see the code? How is this device created? How are the seed phrases created? Um, are you giving someone else access to your Bitcoin? Are you reliant on a third party to gain access to your Bitcoin if you lose a device or do you have access to the tools you need? Um, so I think there's a lot of things that go into it. I don't know if that fully answers it, but I would say dig in, figure out if this is a long-term asset to you, and then figure out how best to store it and take steps to get there. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to toss it down to you a little bit. Let's, let's um, and, and I know we're, we're kind of going on a bit of a tangent here, but I think it's also important to, to touch on because uh, people can become victims if, if they're not care, careful. And uh, uh, in terms of, I, I'm mostly looking at um, being careful when utilizing a device and making sure that you're using the proper software that goes along with it or you're not falling for phishing scams and stuff like that. What are a, a few actions that can be taken anytime that you're dealing with a, a hardware device, anytime you're dealing with it, 
um, in particular around checking that you're sending to the right location, stuff like that. Maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I always, on my Twitter profile, I pinned a little tweet. Like, there are three things that you can do to make sure you don't, you're not sending your Bitcoin or losing your Bitcoin. Um, number one is uh, when this hardware wallet gives you the seed phrase, the list of 24 words, never share that with anybody. Uh, kind of treat it like it's your like social security number. You know, you really don't want it, anyone to know what it is. Um, don't enter it into a website. Don't enter into any, like, um, if anything, you're going to write it into your hardware wallet. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is um, you always want to double check your Bitcoin address, right? Um, so when you, when you look at the Bitcoin address that you're either scanning in a QR code or pasting, just make sure you double check it um, like several times before you actually send it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, one of the nice things about the multi-sig is that you're forced to trans check the transaction multiple times, mm -hmm. right? And so you're forced to, like, in a three or five, you're forced to check it three times before you send it, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, next one is just, um, if anybody ever says that if you send me Bitcoin, I'm going to send you 10 back, just, that's, <laughs> that's a big no-no. Unless it's yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, yeah, just will send you 10 Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I am, and one other thing I wanted to touch on um, in regards to the, the the same kind of checking for uh, inconsistencies, um, you know, it's it's a good idea to uh, realize that rather than let's say you have a, a device that actually plugs into a computer, um, your computer is not the beacon of truth, right? Your computer could be compromised, and what you're seeing on your computer screen could be untruthful. It could be saying you're trying to send to this address, but in the background it's actually not doing that. But the device is meant to be the beacon of truth. So it's always important that on whatever device you're using, you're checking that device to say, is this the same address that, that I want to send to? Um, because all of these devices are built in a way that inherently assumes that your computer has been compromised. It's, it's an assumption that you're, you're dealing with a, a, an infected computer that is trying to steal your Bitcoin. And so always refer to, if you're using a hardware wallet, that to be the truth. And yes, use the tool to interact with it, but, but that's, that's your kind of last line of defense to check what you're doing is factual. And if I can jump in for just a second, just for some people that maybe are new, when you have, um, when you're using a hardware wallet, I like to say device for the reason that we talked about earlier. When you're using a hardware wallet, you're always using some sort of software wallet to interact with it. So that's what I've been speaking of is it'll tell you, hey, here's your deposit address. But on the devices themselves, you can go through and independently verify that that deposit address is associated with the keys it's securing. And so that's, yeah, very important to do. Um, all Trezor, cold card, I, yeah, you can do it with most um, name brand hardware devices. Multi-sig gets a little more complicated, which I won't go into, but, mm -hmm. but yes, and very important. Okay. What would, and I'm going to leave this open to the panel, what would you say for somebody who's never, maybe somebody's out there and they, they, don't, have, uh, they don't have any Bitcoin yet, or maybe they have some Bitcoin sitting on an exchange somewhere, uh, or they're just looking to, to obtain Bitcoin and, and secure it. What's step one? What, what do people do first? Anybody can jump in on this. I would say if you have your Bitcoin on an exchange or maybe you know just trying to get interested in it, one, you can earn Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, I'll throw in some uh, Fold app is great. Lolly, you can actually earn Bitcoin by shopping. Um, but I would say step one is, is download a wallet. I know a lot of people did Moon Wallet yesterday. I'm a big fan of Blue Wallet as well as Green Wallet by Blockstream. Download it and get familiar with it. I think that's step one. Um, write down those seed phrases. Get familiar with what it's like to write down those words and make sure they're, they're spelled correctly, which is always a very intense moment for people. Um, get familiar with what it feels like to store those and then move forward with it and build your confidence. I think confidence is the biggest part. I, I personally find with education, once somebody physically does something and understands that they can do that, that first Bitcoin transaction is absolutely terrifying. And then mm -hmm. after you do it, you're like, oh, Okay, that's not so hard. It's, I mean, it's yeah. still terrifying for me. <laughs> I, I double, triple check that Bitcoin address. You should always time. double check. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, I think it's just doing it yeah. and then it's moving forward. And then you should advance, right? You should be going then from mobile wallet to cold, cold storage. Uh, multi sig is, in my opinion, a big solution here. Um, but that would be my my thought process on it. You can very much get into analysis paralysis where you look and you, you start reading too many things, and, and some of you may be even sitting here listening to this and going, oh my God, 
we just covered so many different things and there's a mm -hmm. lot of phrases up there that I'm not recognizing. But, but again, just taking that first step and, and having ownership yourself of any small amount will at least begin the learning process, right? And I'll just add in one more to kind of um, touch on, on CASA who, and then Unchained Capital. There are ind you know, industries, I, I can't talk anymore, uh, companies <laughs> that will help so walk good. you through it. I know, I'm just you're like, no, you're I am. Doing great. Um, and so if you're an individual who's like, hey, you know, I'm holding this Bitcoin or I want to hold Bitcoin, I want to turn my IRA into Bitcoin, I see the, the why, but I don't see the how. Um, you can sign up for free consultations with both CASA and Unchained. Uh, pretty much, we walk you through how to set up a device, and I'm not trying to shill too hard here, um, but how to set up the device, what a key is, and essentially set up multi-sig, then you can go from there. So I just say that because I have a lot of individuals that I've seen who have been completely terrified to take that step, and all they needed was somebody to sit there and say, yes, that's the right button to push. Mm -hmm. And then the confidence when they get off the call is huge, and mm -hmm. then they move forward feeling very confident in self-custody. So I would recommend that if it works for you. If I could also reiterate, um, view it when you're just starting out, view it as a process and a mm -hmm. process that may likely never be completed. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure that there is Bitcoin itself, the way of securing Bitcoin has been a process over time. Initially, when there was just Bitcoin Core, people stored their private keys on a live computer, maybe protected by a passphrase. And then this concept of segregating the keys and do something with a secure element, like a hardware wallet, became the security standard. And I think the standards are continuing to evolve with more people becoming aware of air gapping and multi-sig. But with your own personal security setup, a lot of people, when they're just beginning to custody their own Bitcoin, they either follow someone on Twitter who seems like a security guru, or they have a close friend or someone they know who seems like they have everything together and they have the perfect setup. Nobody has the perfect setup view it as a process and yeah absolutely like justine said like take that first step and just start the journey and recognize it's it's not going to be a journey you're going to finish that day or that week mm -hmm. um and i'm pretty much out of time here uh i don't want to end this with a a self shill but i'm going to <laughs> um if you have no idea where to start uh i have been making uh youtube videos on uh, almost everything here, seed signer videos soon, mm -hmm. um, but I've been making step-by-step -step tutorials of literally everything we're talking about from the basics You're really good of, too. Of, thank you. <laughs> so kind. Uh, but for five years, the, uh, the, my YouTube channel, BTC Sessions, has been doing very, very simple step-by-step, -step, this is the button you hit, this is exactly what you do to walk you through your first wallet, your first device. So don't let I find a lot of people, they just need that little nudge, uh, that little nod. Yep, you're doing it right, you're okay. So start right away, download a wallet, start with something like Blue Wallet, and it'll be two clicks and you'll be able to start playing and start learning. Just don't get into that habit of analysis paralysis, just start educating yourself. So um, I highly encourage you to follow everybody here, follow up with, with what they're doing. Um, Alex, I just want to double check. What, how's my time? Are we doing 3.30 or are we going beyond that? Yeah, maybe one person just get a final word from everybody. Okay, all right. Uh, we'll, we'll do parting thoughts down the line and, uh, and then we'll be on our way. Andrew, uh, any final thoughts, resources that people can go to um, to help them on their journey? Yeah, go to BTC Sessions YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's fantastic. Uh, no, nah, like if you're if you're a human rights activist, I want to talk to you. If you don't know what Bitcoin is, if you need help, like I, I just want to come talk to you. So come find me. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm here. So uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. See you soon. I'll just say relative to the the uh, seed center devices that Alex and the Human Rights Foundation have been super generous to uh, provide. I'm going to set up either outside or over in the overflow room. And if you would like to sit down and just kind of like get an overview of how it works or see a demo of the device or something, I'll be available over there. Feel free to come over and say hi. Um, thanks so much for your attention. Um, I just wanted, because this is called being your own bank, I just wanted to sort of point out, and I'm, I'm very passionate about individual freedom and feel that Bitcoin is a tool that helps us achieve it. Um, this is the first time in history that we can truly own an asset. And if we know how to use it properly, have no way to be cut off from it. Um, being your own bank includes running a node, so you're interacting directly with the Bitcoin network, holding your keys. It, it's pretty amazing and revolutionary, and, and 
everyone is capable of doing it. You just have to take those first steps. And again, to, to sort of echo what the gentleman said here, I'm available for any questions. You can find me on Twitter as Ms. Hoddle, which isn't very helpful, but my DMs are open, so you can find me there. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, just really, really excited to be here. And again, Alex, thanks for putting this together. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's give a round of applause.